I'm sorry that the microphones are in your way, but they have to be where they are because I've got to be able to see what I'm doing. As I always am able to see what I'm doing. This week, prime time on C-SPAN 2, convention speeches from 1948 through 2000. A look at past presidential and vice presidential nominees, Monday through Thursday at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN 2. We're now going live to the Florida Supreme Court for oral arguments in the Florida Supreme Court case, Jeb Bush versus Michael Schiavo. Are the parties ready? All right, now I understand that you're splitting your time and you, Mr. Destro, are going to make the initial argument. Yes, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed. And go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Robert Destro. I'm here to represent uh, Governor Bush, the appellant in this case. And with me are Kenneth Connor, our, who will argue in rebuttal, and Camille Godwin. And before you get into your argument, the court would appreciate it if, in your order, that you would address the separation of powers argument first before the privacy argument, and then with whatever remaining time, you're free to argue the other issues. Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Terry Schiavo did not have the benefit of an independent advocate at any relevant time before or during the well, implementation. Let's, let's try to get it in okay. into the the argument on separation of power. All right, Your Honor. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, would you agree that the governor did not have the power to order a stay on October 15th, 2003? Your Honor, I, I, no. I think the, the, the order to uh, the, the, the stay is based on the act. Yes, Your Honor. So the governor's power to act and interstate came solely from the legislature. Yes, Your Honor, the, the power of parents patriate does come from the, the legislature. The legisl was it the, is it something unique about the governor that the legislature could give this power to, or could the, could the legislature give this power to you? No, Your Honor, but in fact, the legislature has given the power to any person in the state of Florida to, uh, to raise the question of the rights of a vulnerable adult in an appropriate court, and that's really all this act does. Okay, I've got one, one, one more question along this line. Now, yes, sir. this legislation then that delegated this power, it, it, it did it to involve in reality a single case, correct? No, Your Honor, it did not. Well, wh what other cases were would meet the description of somebody that had uh, the the court ordered uh, uh, the whole line of things that are in this statute other than uh, the petitioner in this case? Well, Your Honor, the, the statute itself is, is open-ended. Certainly, Terry Schiavo fits within the description of the statute, but it would be a question of fact as to whether or not there are other people in the state of Florida at any given time, during the time this statute was in effect, it would certainly be a question of fact, and there are other people who could fit that description. Uh, the statute's very clear on its face that you don't have an advanced directive, that the court has found that when nutrition and hydration can be withdrawn, there could be any number of people, and it would be a question of fact as to how many were but in the state of Florida at that time. Wouldn't those people have to fit into this 15-day time period. This act came into effect on, on a particular day, and 15 days later, it's no longer in effect. Is that, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, that's true. And so we, whether, whether uh, Chiavo is the only person who meets the criteria or some other people in the statute who would have to be in that short 15-day time period, is that not correct? And they would have to meet each of the criteria outlined in that statute. Yes, Your Honor, and if I can just add, though, if the legislature, the separation of powers uh, issue that the court is rightly concerned about would also be the case if the legislature had amended Chapter 765 and provided this as a procedure across the board, which it, it could do after this case. Well, that's now, let's get back to the issue of the, first of all, there's two aspects to the separation of powers. One is the facial 
constitutional <laughs> issue, which is the whether this is an unlawful delegation of unfettered discretion to the executive branch. The second issue we're talking about is whether, as applied to Terry Schiavo, it is an encroachment on the judicial branch's final order and giving the governor a super appellate power. So on the issue of the unfettered discretion and going back to what uh, Justice Wells says, this are you saying this statute could have been set up and given the uh, uh, power to issue this one-time stay to anybody, any agency in the executive branch? No, Your Honor. The, the legislature gave this power to the governor because the governor historically stands in the role of parents patriot. He's the ultimate defender of people's civil rights in the state of Florida. He's sworn to see that the law is faithfully executed. And, and with that, so the governor would be the only proper person that the legislature could give this super appellate uh, review power power to. Well, it's not, Your Honor, that I, I, would, I would argue somewhat with your characterization that this is a super appellate power. In point of fact, Your Honor, this is, a, uh, this is the opportunity for the, uh, the governor to raise the due process questions on behalf of Terry Schiavo. That the, the allegation here is that Terry Schiavo was denied due process in the proceedings below. But that's, if, if the governor had tried to intervene in the ongoing proceedings and raise some question as an interesting party as to whether Sherry, Terry Schiavo's due process rights had been interfered with, we'd be in a different situation. What we're here with is the issue of whether this law is facially unconstitutional by giving the governor the, this, the power to issue this one-time stay, but it's not required to do so, lift the stay at any time, may do so, and may revoke the stay, all without any standards. Well, Your Honor, this is, this is the, the problem that, that I have with that particular argument, is that the, the, this law does not make any sense unless it's read in peri materia with Chapter 765 and Chapter 744. In fact, we would argue that, in point of fact, that constitutionally, in order to give people with severe disabilities the right to question the adequacy of their representation below. You have to read these, these, uh, these, these statutes in peri materia. It's not designed to be part of Chapter 765, is it? Your Honor, I think it's, it's, I think actually, Your Honor, it adds that extra level of protection to Chapter 765. But is it doesn't do it on the face. Is it an amendment to Chapter 765? Is it an additional section? I think it should be read that way, but, but the legislature did this quickly. Did the legislature amend ch Chapter 765 to add a new section, which is this law? I think you could read. I think you should read it that way. Yes. Well, I, I don't want to read anything that's not in there. <laughs> it's not on I'm, the face. I'm though. asking you if the legislature said that it was amending Chapter 765 or any other chapter by adding this new section. No, it did not say that on the face of the statute. But I think reading the statute in, in terms of what it provides, it's tied very clearly to 744 and 765. And as is, there, is there any other case from this court in which we have read into an act that it amends a particular chapter of the Florida laws when it doesn't specifically say so? Your Honor, the, this court has said in, in Ferguson versus State and in other cases that, that when the face of the statute shows that it is clearly related to other statutes, it should be read in peri materia with them. If it's clear on its face that, that it can stand alone, and our have, argument is that it, that it simply cannot in, stand alone. Have you, in terms of looking at the purpose of this law, and I'm not sure whether when we get into separation of powers, whether that's the relevant inquiry, but could you then address, because I know the whole argument is that this is giving this protection, what, uh, where the 15-day expiration date. In other words, uh, it's an idea that we're going to protect a whole uh, class of disabled individuals, severely disabled individuals who already have been found to be in a persistent vegetative state, who already have had hydration uh, and uh, withdrawn, and it, but it only lasts for 15 days. Well, Your Honor, given the nature of, the, uh, of, of what 
was going on not only in this case, but in all cases in which nutrition and hydration is withdrawn, there is a temporal imperative that, that there be an action before all the constitutional rights to due process, equal protection, and, uh, and privacy are lost. Are there, so that, that, I'm sorry? Are, are there any other places in, in the Florida statute where the governor has this kind of uh, power to stay proceedings? Well, Your Honor, actually, the uh, the governor does have the the power in death cases to but uh, to stay. You're talking about Chapter 922. Uh, yes, and the clemency power. Is and then uh, Chapter 922, uh, isn't there standards and procedures that the governor has to uh, abide by if he, in fact, uh, enters a stay? Yes, there is, and, and we would say, Your Honor, that Chapter 765 and Chapter 744 provide the standards because what the governor can do under this statute, and it's clear he can, uh, he, he makes the findings and he makes a discretionary finding about whether or not he, he feels that probable cause has, has been and made to, to put there, a stand. And what is the, uh, under this uh, act, what is the governor required to do? As I read it, the governor really isn't required to do anything. The stay could stay indefinitely. Well, Your Honor, the, if, again, that's the importance of reading this in light of Chapter 765 and Chapter 744, because the governor takes, he, get, he goes and he asks the, uh, the circuit court for a guardian ad litem. They wait for the guardian ad litem to come back with the report, the reports back. This case has to be seen in light of the ongoing guardianship jurisdiction of the circuit court. Justice Wells court. has a question. I'm sorry, you're, me, Justice Wells. But let, let me get back to, to, isn't the cardinal principle of separation of power set forth by, in the United States Supreme Court uh, case, that Spendthrift case, when which it says that a legislature without exceeding its province cannot reverse a determination once made in a particular case, though it may prescribe a new rule for future cases. And isn't what, in reality, what this is all boiled down to, the legislature stepped in here and reversed a decision that was final in a specific case. No, Your Honor, it didn't. In fact, the face of the statute makes it very clear that the, the legislature provided a rule, a prospective rule of procedure that would take place after the mandate was carried out. It did not, like in Plout, go back and change a rule that, that the court had, uh, had already announced. It did not stop the mandate from taking place. The mandate actually was carried out. And what it did was to enact a procedural rule, a, proce a process going forward from October the 21st, 2003, that did nothing with respect to, the, uh, to intrude on the power of the court. Let, let's, can we explore the parameters uh, of your, uh, the basis for your argument? And certainly we've got a, a singular set of facts that we're dealing with here. Uh, but uh, would the legislature have the, the, the power to delegate to the governor uh, the ability to set aside any civil judgment on the basis of, in the governor's view, uh, that uh, did not meet due process requirements, uh, civil monetary uh, damages, uh, uh, cases involving uh, family law, that the judge did not adequately protect the children uh, in this, uh, the way that custody was handled? Would you explore for us? The parameters. I mean, what, what are we opening up here if we start talking about this? How, how broad is this or how narrow is it? Actually, Your Honor, I think this is a very narrow principle because the, uh, what we're dealing with here is, is the, impl the full implications of the Browning decision where this court held that an incompetent person has the same rights that, that, a, uh, that, a, that, that a competent person is going to have to come up because somebody... And if it's not going to be the governor, and I think it's a rational choice for the legislature to make, to say that the governor can stand in this person's shoes and assure, and to raise the question, was there adequate representation in the court below? But the, That's the act does not even require the governor to take what the underlying litigation was that went over a, a six-year period was to determine what Terry Schiavo's wishes would have been if she were in a position to assert them at, at, 
the time that the final judgment was entered. Do you agree with that? We're not looking at what is in the best interest of a, an adult, but what is would be their wishes. Would you, do you agree with that? Well, Your Honor, the governor... That's what Browning says. Yes, Your Honor, the governor is sworn to uphold not only Chapter 765 and this court's holding in Browning, you know, but he is, his duty is to make sure that Terry's rights are respected. But, and so, but where is that stated within the, con the confines of the law that was enacted by the legislature? And that gets me back to the issue of this unfettered discretion. There are no standards. There is no requirement that standards be promulgated. Uh, there is no length of time that the stay remains in effect, and essentially there is no individual or entity that can overrule that stay. Your Honor, this, this is where the, the, the uh, we would argue the constitutional necessity of reading this in peri materia with se section 765 because that, see, that does in fact provide the standards. But 765 is the statute that was followed that was enacted by the legislature that was not amended in the last legislative session that gives a very, very substantial procedure when individuals want to challenge the decision of a proxy. And there has been no allegation that that procedure was not scrupulously adhered to in the case of Terry Schiavo. But, Your Honor, in this case, Terry Schiavo's proxy was the judge. And the difficulty with, with, the, uh, with that procedure is that Terry Schiavo is now the governor and Terry Schiavo, who's standing in her shoes under the statute, is forced to litigate against the judge, which this court said in TW, in footnote three, is absolutely intolerable as a matter of, of due process. So that the, so that this is really where those, uh, those statutes fit together. I know I'm into my rebuttal time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. And Mr. Philos. Philos, okay. Sorry, I was looking at the next case. <laughs> Mr. Philos, could you um, follow up with that last response? Because if you look at 765, it does address the question of, of the proxy and the proxy making the decision. Could you address the argument uh, that in, in this case the, the judge became the proxy? Uh, well, Could you Your first Honor. introduce yourself, though, and tell us who you sir. represent on Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm George Philos. I'm counsel for Mrs. Schiavo's guardian, Michael Schiavo. I'm here this morning uh, with co-counsel Randall Marshall, uh, who's the director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida, and also Mr. Thomas Pirelli of Jenner and Block, cooperating counsel with the Florida ACLU. And on behalf of my client, we did want to thank the court for accepting the bypass certification and expediting consideration of this case. And in, in answer to your question, it um, seems to me that if you read the um, briefs to invoke this court's discretionary jurisdiction in Shiva 1, these are, the ar these are the questions that we argued. Those were the arguments of, of Terry's uh, parents in seeking review of the initial Shiva 1 decision. The, were the due process rights of the ward affected in the, uh, uh, by the child judge uh, having a, uh, in, in essence, acting as, uh, as a proxy? And obviously this court didn't think so three years ago by, um, uh, by electing not to take its discretionary jurisdiction. And I, ju I just want to highlight, in essence, what the, what the governor is trying to do in this case is relitigate re and force a re-adjudication of Terry Schiavo's rights, which have already been fully and finally litigated in the courts of the state. The procedure that was followed uh, was the procedure that was set forth in Browning and then it subsequently uh, put into statutory format by the legislature, which anticipates that if uh, there is a dispute between the parties that the judge would uh, set forth a decision. But if prospectively the legislature determined that there should be a procedure that, say, takes the initial uh, aspect of this very, very private decision out of the court and starts with some administrative process, uh, and requires there be a guardian at litem appointed uh, for an incompetent adult. Would you see any constitutional infirmity in such a, uh, an act? And how does this, the, what we have in front of us, differ from that? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I would say constitutional infirmity for uh, a number of reasons. First off, from the aspect of the constitutional right to privacy here, 
The, the violation here is taking from the patient and giving to the state the power to make medical treatment choices. And if, if you're contemplating a procedure in which the current format of having a guardian, a spouse, an adult child, close family members make a decision for an incapacitated a patient and you, t and you remove that and, and give that decision making to the state, even if it's in the context of a legislative scheme, um, yes, I think there are problems. Uh, but isn't that what we do with the uh, Department of Children and Families? In other words, when we're in a situation where we're concerned whether the rights of an individual who cannot express himself or herself either by minority or by incompetency, the idea of having additional procedures to make sure that the state's interest in preserving life is uh, is uh, honored and that's the that is the the norm why why wouldn't a procedure like that be appropriate and isn't that what they are trying to do maybe belatedly in this situation well your honor I would disagree that's what they're trying to do belatedly I think as justice uh, well stated it's obvious here that the intent of the legislature here was to overturn a judgment uh, a final judgment of the court of this state that they they were particularly uh, displeased with but getting back to your question your honor a uh, a guardian uh, a guardian is already appointed under Chapter 765, and when you ask, if you ask, can we take an, administra a, an administration of a patient's constitutional rights or a dispute and take it out of the court system into, into another forum, I guess I would want to know what type of forum there is and, and who the decision maker is. You know, you have to remember these are intensely personal and private rights we're talking about here. Let, 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 let me ask you, uh, your, your uh, opponents make the uh, point that we are not really though, talking about a judgment which was final since this issue in this guardianship is not final a as long as uh, Ms. Schiavo is, is still alive. Now, what, what is your answer to that, that this is always a prospective type of situation? Your Honor, this is a final judgment for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it was a final statement or final word of the court system of the state of Florida. It was acknowledged by the Court of Appeal many times as a final judgment, uh, also appealed as a final judgment. But the fact, Your Honor, that under our system of justice, under the rules of procedure, a final judgment can be vacated under certain grounds, and in, in this ground, and, and the purported grounds here is Rule 1.540 B5. The fact that a final judgment could be vacated in the future doesn't make it any less final for separation of powers. To follow that logic, Your Honor, every civil judgment in this state would no longer be final and subject to legislative rescindment because, because it could be vacated, potentially vacated, under Rule 1.540 B5. Could the I governor was... file a motion under 1.540 B5 right now or any other subsection of 1.540 saying circumstances have changed or there's new evidence? Your Honor, I don't, uh, I don't believe so. Uh, I believe that 1.540 B5 um, is is concerned and pertains to uh, to parties uh, in the case, but I, I also did because it's a very important point as to whether this is a final judgment because that triggers the separation of powers um, analysis, Your Honor. Your Honor brought up the analogy of a child custody case. It is very true that in a family law situation, when a judge awards a custody of a minor child to one parent. That becomes a final judgment, it can be appealed, but the trial court or the family law court retains jurisdiction over that case, over that child, until the child uh, reaches eman emancipation. And under that theory, because the trial court could address the custody issue at some time in the, in the future, if we're saying that's not a final judgment, then the, the separation of powers protection, the firewall of separation of powers is eradicated in family law cases, and that's certainly not, not the law of this state. Can you address the governor's argument uh, or counter-argument to that, that uh, he's not bound by that, if it's a judgment, he's not bound by that judgment because he wasn't a party to that proceeding, and therefore 
collateral estoppel or res judicata principles would not apply to him. They don't have to apply, Your Honor, because that's a red herring issue. The, the fact is, the, the fact that he was not a party to the, to the judgment does not alter the fact that the judgment was entered. And if we follow that logic, well, the, the governor for separation of, or the legislature can rescind judicial judgments to which the legislature or governor were not a party, well, then the vast majority of judgments would be subject to legislative rescindment. And I... Is there any... If the, if the governor cannot intervene based on uh, Rule 1.540, is there any procedure by which the governor could, in fact, have uh, intervened in this proceeding? I don't believe so, Your Honor, but the state's interests are protected. If you, uh, in these cases, if you read Browning, if you read the Dubriel uh, decision, the, the Wands decision, this court was very clear to say, and it arose in the context of a health care provider. If a health care provider disagrees with the patient's medical treatment choice, do they have standing uh, to contest it in court? This court said no. What the health care provider would have to do is go to the state attorney and give this information to the state attorney. It would be up to the state attorney to decide whether to intervene in a particular, in a particular case. So it's not to say that the, the state's interests uh, interest in preserving life or whatever, inter whatever interest they might assert cannot be addressed, but, uh, but not by the governor. Can I ask a question? In the second DCA's opinion of uh, July of 01, it refers to the judgment specifically or the order in, in the terms of a, a mandatory injunction and not as a final judgment. And it says, until the life prolonging procedures are discontinued, such an order is entirely executory and the ward and guardian continue to be under the jurisdiction and supervision of the guardianship court. As long as the ward is alive, the order is subject to recall and is executory in nature. Mm -hmm. Address that in, your, in, in, in the sense of finality. Yes, but if you also look, uh, Your Honor, at that opinion, uh, the second district, I believe it was in Shivo 2, specifically refers to the order of the guardianship as a final order. And the, and the second district also said the procedure by which that order could be reopened is the 1.54 B5 procedure. And I think it is, it is absolutely extraordinary for the, for the governor to argue that the legislature in 18 hours and the governor in a, in a matter of hours somehow possesses some in, inherent wisdom in, in regarding the matters of Terry Schiavo that could not have been ascertained by the, by the justices of this state in over a six-year period. And well, Frank, let's approach that just, just a little bit. Yes. I mean, are you suggesting that the legislative power uh, can never be exercised to protect uh, disabled children? Uh, in this state, we, we have numerous children in this state who are disabled and cannot make decisions for themselves. Are you suggesting that the legislature cannot come in and place safeguards to protect the well-being uh, and the, the virtual life of these disabled children? Absolutely not. Uh, but Terry Schiavo, uh, Terry Schiavo was a competent adult who expressed medical treatment choices. Well, that's, now you're going into the procedure. Are, are you suggesting that the legislature uh, could not prohibit this kind of, of procedure, that you must have something in writing, you must have a, a procedure other than a, someone's friend coming in and, and expressing what they think the person wants. We didn't have the testimony of Ms. Shivo in this case, did we? It was all testimony of other individuals. Of other individuals. And that would always be the case, would it not, with incompetence and disabled children <coughs> in your, the state? Your Honor, but to answer your question, if the legislature amended Chapter 765 and said, we're not going to permit removal of artificial life support unless somebody has a written advance a directive. No, that law would be unconstitutional because this court has declared in the, in the Browning case that in order to, uh, in order to recognize and implement, and implement an individual's right of privacy, oral declarations are sufficient uh, to establish, uh, as long as they're by clear and convincing evidence, the intent of, of the patient. So such a legislative enactment in that case would be, uh, in my so opinion, So you are saying that the legislature cannot come up with criteria contrary to the way that the judicial system has interpreted uh, a privacy right. That's, that's the fundamental base of your argument, then. I, I, would say, I would say, Your Honor, that the Browning case provides the minimum uh, right of privacy that a, uh, 
a patient is entitled to. And the legislature may certainly uh, legislate uh, in the field um, to, uh, to protect the public and to, and to make sure that the right of privacy is, uh, is effectuated. But we're really but talking... They can't, they can't fall below that minimum. But, I mean, now, I mean, in, in the Cruzan case, if you look back at what the, uh, the Supreme Court in Missouri did, they essentially decided that the testimony of a neighbor was not clear and convincing evidence of uh, the, uh, the person's wishes. So, I mean, if we're getting, and, we, and probably we may be getting a little far afield of what we have to decide in this case, but because uh, the issue isn't whether the legislature could enact something much more comprehensive to uh, better address this type of situation, which is. Uh, you know, it's getting tragic for everybody. So could you get back to the, the issue on, uh, with the separation of powers, could the legislature, uh, if this wasn't Terry Schiavo, and we're just looking at the facial challenge, uh, what is wrong with what the legislature did in, in this case as far as giving this uh, power to stay uh, for one time uh, the uh, withholding of uh, hydration to and well, a one-time basis aside from the intrusion into the judiciary which is the separation of powers violation as applied to uh, Terry the as applied challenge yeah. as to the facial challenge there there are are two the impermissible impermissible legislative uh, delegation as as uh, as Your Honor mentioned, there are no standards. Now, the, the test for impermissible legislative delegation is this. Could a court, in reviewing the decision, be able to ascertain whether the decision maker acted with indiscretion or abuse discretion? And, and that statute fails in this way. If there were judicial review permitted, and of course there is no judicial review, so that could never occur in this case, but if there were judicial review, how would we ever know, how, how could we even begin to make that determination when we don't even know what the basis for the governor's decision is? Because he's not required under this act to tell us the basis of his decision. Well, can you address the governor's arguments, or your counsel's arguments that uh, you have to read this act in paramateria with chapter 765 and I believe 764 and th those provide the guidelines. That doctrine, Your Honor, only pertains to situation where there's ambiguity in the statute. This court held in Holly versus Ald that if there is no ambiguity, facial ambiguity in the statute, that this court can't resort um, to that type of uh, statutory uh, interpretation. So that doctrine doesn't apply here. We're not talking about an, uh, an, uh, an ambiguous statute. This statute is crystal clear what it does. It gives the governor unfettered and absolute authority. And, and, but to follow that, even if, we, even if there were, uh, even if the governor did tell us um, or could be compelled to tell us what the basis of his decision was, there's no standards to apply. How do we know whether the legislature wanted the governor to consider the cost-benefit analysis for uh, providing medical treatment? How do we know whether the legislature wanted the governor to take into account family wishes rather than the wishes of the patient? How are we to know whether the legislature wanted the governor to act in the best interest of the patient as opposed to determining the subjective intent of the, of the patient? Based on this statute, can anyone lift this day? Can this day be, be lifted? No one standing here. Did, was there any attempt to do that in the proceedings below? To have the stay lifted? Or was it, it was only an attack on the constitutionality? On the constitutionality, uh, Your Honor. I don't believe the, uh, Your Honor, I don't believe the, the statute provides any mechanism to have the governor's uh, decision so uh, what, reviewed. So what is the point then of the part, that part of the act which says that you then appoint a guardian who reports or makes recommendations to the governor and the court. Well, I believe the statute makes, says it makes recommendations uh, to the governor. In terms of power and authority, there's there's no point. We don't know. We don't know whether the governor read the report or didn't read the report, or if he did read the report, took it into consideration, or 
you know, picked it up and, and, and tossed it away. So as, as far as a, the statute itself, it changes nothing as to the impermissible delegation uh, of authority. But I also, since I only have two minutes, uh, two minutes left, Your Honor, wanted to address the, also, the, the facial unconstitutionality uh, regards the, uh, regarding the right, uh, the right of privacy. And, and I touched on this before. The essential issue here is who is entitled to make a decision on a matter so personal and private as, as, as whether one would want artificial life support. Does that, does that power constitutionally reside with the patient? Or does that power reside with the state? Do you agree that if we uh, hold that this statute is unconstitutional as a violation of separation of powers, or at least as applied to Terry Schiavo, it's unconstitutional, it's basically not going to apply to anybody else. So by holding it's unconstitutional as applied, we're really saying it's unconstitutional as its face as well, practically speaking. It's not going to apply to anybody else, is it? It's not going to apply to... Uh, to another case, but we would ask this court, of course, specifically to find that it's unconstitutional as applied to Terry Schiavo because it's an unlawful intrusion into judicial power for this reason. If this court only found the, con the statute facially unconstitutional, let's say, for improper delegation of legislative authority, we don't want, and, and, and chose not to address the as applied separation of power argument, we don't want to be here a year from now um, arguing the constitutionality or unconstitutionality of, of Terry's law, too. This young woman has a right to have her final adjudication honored by the courts of Florida. <laughs> this unlawful intrusion into that right um, should be overturned and definitively overturned so her right to privacy can be affected. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Connor. May it please the court, I'm Ken Connor with the firm of Wilkes and McHugh, and I, along with Professor Destro, represent the governor in this action. Mr. Connor, why is this not a prohibited special act? Because the act applies uniformly to all people who uh, fall within its classification. And if that classification applies to only one person? Uh, judge, the fact that it may apply actually uh, to only one person doesn't make it a special act. Uh, th there are any number of potential people who could fall within the purview of the act if they meet the four criteria. That is, they didn't have an advanced uh, written directive. Uh, uh, they've been deemed to be in a persistent vegetative state. Nutrition and hydration are being withheld, and the family has a challenge. If they meet but those, those criteria, not, you know, they fall. Those are not the only criteria, are they? I mean, it, it says, plus, the, the court has found the patient to be in a persistent vegetative state and a member of the patient's family has challenged the withholding of nutrition and hydration. I mean, you're not asking us to, to really hold that this act doesn't pertain just to Terry. Uh, By the face of it, Your Honor, uh, it does apply to more than just Terry. Terry Schiavo's case was the triggering event for it. We see that all the time in the we legislature. Would have to, we would have to ignore reality to do that, wouldn't we, Don? Well, Judge, the fact that we have Megan's law or Adam's law, the fact that we have specific fact situations involving specific individuals that trigger but the need for legislative relief. But particular cases. That's, that's, that's where I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble with the fact that when I read this act, objectively, I cannot come to the conclusion that it doesn't pertain to this single case that's been in litigation for a decade and that what is going on here is that the legislature set about to set aside what the final judgment of the court pertaining to that case. Without a doubt, Your Honor, it does apply in this particular case to Terry Schiavo because she met the criteria. There are others who likewise could meet the criteria. It does not respectfully, I would submit, involve a reversal of the final judgment of, of a circuit court precisely for the reasons uh, indicated by Judge Bell in Schiavo II where the court made the point that these orders are entirely executory. As long as the ward is alive, the order is subject to recall and is executory in nature. The mandate of the court had been complied with. 
The order of the court was not that Terry Schiavo should have nutrition and hydration withdrawn until she was dead. It wasn't like an order that said so-and-so shall be hanged by the neck until dead. But Mr. It, Connor, yes, they, the court went on and specifically said because they understood that the challenge was being raised more than one year after and they were really trying hard to make sure that the, uh, that, that the Schindlers had some opportunity to raise this new claim that there might be some new life-saving uh, treatment. And what the court then said is we caution, however, that any proceeding to a challenge a final order on this basis is extraordinary and should not be filed merely to delay an order with which an interested party disagrees or to retry an adversary proceeding. And the mechanism they set up was Rule 1.540B5, which is for challenges to final judgment. So we must, you know, to take one line out of, a, uh, of one opinion that, and there's a series of four opinions, really is not uh, the correct way to look at this. Well, Your Honor, unquestionably, this, th this language arose in the context of 1.540 challenge. But the reality of it is that that is the nature of guardianship orders. They're executory so are you until the disability that, is removed. So that therefore they're, what, and then they're reviewed as non-final orders and any interested party, you know, year after year can come in and make challenges? No, ma'am. What I'm saying is that the courts do not possess the exclusive domain to protect the rights of disabled people and to ensure that their health care choices are respected and protected. That well, there is a role for the legislature. So there is a role for the government. Are we ignoring that in this law, which didn't, again, become a part of an amendment to the uh, chapter law in the uh, session that, that uh, uh, succeeded the law, it was a 15-day sunset? It ap applied to whoever was in this situation for 15 days, and then this great protection that the legislature wanted to give expired and has not been renewed. Your Honor, that demonstrates, I think, how this law, in fact, was narrowly tailored. The legislature wanted to see how it worked. They had an opportunity to tweak it. My time is up, Your Honors. I would respectfully request that the court recognize that there is a role for the legislature and the governor in protecting the rights of the disabled and ensuring that their health care decisions are respected and protected. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the arguments. Uh, the court will take a <coughs> recess before calling the next case. And we would ask, uh, out of uh, deference to the parties, that before the rest of the courtroom empties, that the uh, attorneys and the, uh, the parties be able to leave the courtroom. Thank you very much. A reminder that you can hear these oral arguments in Bush v. Shivo on America and the Courts. That's Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Today on C-SPAN 2, we'll show you the House Government Reform Committee hearings on the September 11 Commission report, beginning in a couple of minutes with Commissioners Bob Carey and John Lehman. At 1 p.m., we'll hear from relatives of those lost in the September 11 terrorist attacks. They're followed at 2.40 by Comptroller David Walker. And wrapping up at 3.30 p.m., Commission Chairman Tom Kane and his colleague Jamie Gorelick talk about public diplomacy in the Middle East. C-SPAN's convention coverage gets underway this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern with a preview program. We'll take your calls, interview some of the delegates, and take you behind the scenes at the convention. The convention starts at 7.00.